All right, let's get started. Well, thank you all so much for coming out. It is really my pleasure to, to have you all here, and uh, I look forward to a great discussion uh, with our guest here. And I'll introduce them in just one moment. Um, I know that we have a lot of folks on Twitter in the room, so if you're tweeting tonight, our hashtag is Hewitt14. So if you want to jot that down with your pen and paper and tweet it later, you can do that. So again, my name is Josh Archambault. I'm a senior fellow at the Pioneer Institute, and it's really my pleasure to be part of this event. Um, for those of you that may not be as familiar with Pioneer Institute, we are a independent, nonpartisan, privately funded research organization that seeks to improve the quality of life here in Massachusetts through civic discourse, which we hope for tonight, and I'm sure we will get, and intellectually rigorous, data-driven public policy solutions based on free market principles, individual liberty and responsibility, and the ideal of effective, limited, and accountable government. I don't have that memorized, I should. <laughs> but really, we're also here to honor a man that uh, has meant uh, meant a lot to Pioneer, uh, but also to the, the broader Boston community, and that was uh, Kobe Hewitt, which this uh, lecture is named off of. And uh, Kobe was served for 25 years as a trustee of New England Deaconess Hospital, and for four years served as its chairman, and uh, subsequently active, was very active as chair emeritus, the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Kobe joined the Pioneer Board in 1993 and assumed our chair in 1997, and he remained as chair until his death in 2005. So we like to gather once a year to not only hear a great discussion about healthcare, but also to honor his legacy and his contribution, again, not only to the Boston area, but also to Pioneer. And I just want to take one moment and uh, thank the Hewitt family. Um, Chuck is, sits on our board, his son, and we just really appreciate their contribution. So thank you very much. Uh, we also are very thankful to our sponsors who make this possible, Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, the Diazla and Aiken family uh, for their support, uh, certainly the Hewitt family, Dr. Mel Klaus as well, Stewart, health services administrators, and we want to just give a special thanks to the Massachusetts Association of Health Underwriters uh, for letting their members know about this event as well. So if we could thank our sponsors. All right, so before we open this up uh, to our invited guests, I can find our mouse here. Disappeared. Oh, there we go. All right, we're on our way here. All right, here we go. So before we, we have a, a, this broader discussion, mostly at the national level, I thought it might be helpful for me just to provide a very short snapshot on what's kind of going on here in Massachusetts <coughs> related to the Affordable Care Act. And um, uh, as I was telling some of the Pioneer staff in the past, my father said that you should always start a presentation with a cartoon because at least people can chuck about, chuckle about the message for the rest of the presentation if you're boring. So these, these are some examples that we've seen related to Obamacare, but I want to focus on this one in particular. And this made its rounds during the election, and you know, as we've seen the rhetoric get very hot during the campaign, it has remained hot uh, locally. There has been an interesting bipartisan agreement that the two laws are the same. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at this, the two parties look at this and draw very different conclusions. If you're a national Republican, you think uh, this is exactly why government doesn't get involved in health care. It's overly expensive, too much regulation. If you're a, Democrat, a national Democrat, you thought this was a great plan. We should emulate this at the national level. Now, from Pioneer's perspective, which is much more of a policy-oriented one, we are have been fighting this battle all through the campaign to say, no, look, there's actually a more nuanced discussion to be had here. Not only about the differences between the laws and the incentives that are in there, but also um, from the perspective of where are states starting from. That is going to matter um, in, a very big, uh, in a very big way going forward as we see the ACA implemented. And I wanted to just give a handful of examples of this. 
So often in healthcare, it helps to remove ourselves from healthcare and think of an analogy outside. So for us, the Romney care, the, the Massachusetts law, is a little bit like a car. And the national law, the ACA, is a lot like a train. Now, they both have similarities. They, of course, both have wheels and windows and a steering mechanism, but I think everybody would acknowledge they're fundamentally different. The scope and scale of them are really different. And I think, well, if we were to spend two hours dissecting those differences, we would start to understand some of the intricacies. In Incentives matter, and people react to those incentives in a very different way. And Romney Care was a much smaller, didn't impact as many people, and done at the state level, reacting to whatever the regulations were. And interestingly enough, partially deregulated the individual market, whereas the federal law does the opposite, often putting additional regulations into other states' insurance market. I do have just one plug for those of you that do want to get deep into the weeds. Uh, I have an article coming out very shortly in the American Journal of Law and Medicine that looks at just one area, which is the labor market impacts in Massachusetts of the law, and then contrast that to the federal law. And that starts to get at that really important educational difference. But tonight I wanted to talk about just four areas very briefly. <coughs> And we'll start with the connector. Perhaps if you read the news on a regular basis, you've seen some of the challenges that they've run into. And I think it's fair to say they have failed in setting up and standing up an ACA compliant website. They have enrolled successfully 800 people for subsidized coverage and about 30,000 for unsubsidized coverage. Now for context, at this point they projected they were gonna have 200 to 250,000 individuals signed up. So they are very far from where they wanted to be and the website still is not uh, running. It was announced uh, this morning or last night uh, that they're gonna move forward in a two-pronged approach and hire a brand new contractor for the next five months to try to get the website up and running while at the same time making sure that they could default to healthcare.gov if that doesn't work out. Um, from my perspective, because I have the microphone, <laughs> Trying to do something in five months that you failed to do in the four years before is probably not a recipe for success, but we'll have to wait and see if I'm wrong or not. Um, however, with that being said, uh, there has not been any discussion of price tag for what this will cost going forward, so certainly this is something to continue to watch. If you are on our um, mailing list, you'll, you'll know that a couple weeks ago we sent out over 100 questions that we feel like are still unanswered about what happened at the connector and what they need to, uh, the issues that they're going to address. And those questions still largely remain unanswered. And if you're interested in learning more about that, I'd be happy to forward those questions to you. For those of you that haven't followed this, to give you just one snapshot of how bad it got, at one point they had 50,000 paper applications that they had to hire an outside consultant to manually enter in so that people could be covered. So as a result, the state is spending about $20 million extra every month for not only consultants, but also for some of the coverage situations that they set up to prevent gaps in coverage. Now, those situations are, they have about 190,000 people on Medicaid. They don't know if they qualify for Medicaid. They don't know if they qualify for subsidies. They actually don't know anything about them other than they applied for a subsidy. Um, and as a result, we're gonna have to wait and see as they process those accounts, what the cost overruns will be for the taxpayers. They also kick the can down the road a little bit. They have about 100,000 people who are still on Romney Care subsidized coverage. Those individuals still have to go through the enrollment process at some point. Let's move on to Medicaid, which we call Mass Health here in Massachusetts. So under the Affordable Care Act, when our expansion is done, which it is in the process of being implemented, a quarter of our state population will be on this program. 30% of residents in Boston will be on the program. And this is uh, uh, the single largest line item in the state budget, accounting for about 40% of the cost. Uh, about 325,000 people will be added to the program as a result of the Affordable Care Act. And while most other states, the feds picked up 100% of the cost for the first few years, Massachusetts is actually different. We only get 75% of the cost and eventually ratchets up to 90% by 2020. There's a lot of other changes to the Medicaid program that I won't go into tonight, but I just wanted to mention that there is uh, some promising changes for dual eligibles. These are individuals who qualify for both Medicaid and Medicare. 
And as uh, the Affordable Care Act allows the state to combine those two streams of funding to try to get better coordination of care for these individuals, this is low hanging fruit, probably should have been done years and years ago, and could have great savings as these folks t typically run about $25,000 a year in medical expenses. Let's move on to the money. Talk a little bit about taxes and cuts coming here in Massachusetts. As far as the taxes are concerned, Massachusetts will pay a disproportionate amount compared to other states due to our, us being a little bit more high income and our industry mix. And a lot of Pioneer's research over the last 18 months or so has tried to pull apart those individual tax provisions to estimate what its impact is here in the state. And here's what we found. So as far as extra money coming in, the way that the subsidies are paid for and due to the Medicaid expansion, about $3 billion of additional federal dollars will be coming into the state over the next 10 years. So from a state budget perspective, I guess you could say that's a good thing. From a taxpayer perspective, you may have a different perspective. Uh, as far as some of the individual taxes, and I'll just go through six very briefly that we've looked at. The Medicare payroll tax, over a certain income threshold for individuals estimated to be $1.7 billion over the next 10 years, uh, leaving Massachusetts down to DC to pay for the law. The insurance tax that will be applied to most individuals is $3.89 billion over the next 10 years. Again, you can either write these down or come up to me. We have reports related to these on our website. The medical device tax uh, estimated to be $4.2 billion over the next 10 years for the 19 largest companies here in Massachusetts. The unearned income tax of 3.8%, again, over a certain income threshold, uh, we have not been able to calculate the impact due to the lack of data. Uh, the pharmaceutical tax, the same is true. We haven't been able to calculate the impact. Finally, I want to just note uh, one tax that you all should be aware of, which is the Cadillac tax. This tax kicks in in uh, 2018. And we've run some initial estimates, assuming the status quo for healthcare growth over the future, roughly how, what percentage of the population will be hit by this. And by our estimates, it's something like 65 to 70% of citizens in Massachusetts will be hit. Now, this is assuming the status quo and that plan designs don't change, that healthcare increases at the same amount. Now, there's a very good discussion to be had about how many people will be impacted by the Cadillac tax. What's certain, though, is that it will, is very likely to hit teachers, municipal workers, a lot of white collar workers with these health insurance plans. Because our health premiums are the top in the nation, it will hit a lot of people in the state. The big debate is how many people it will hit and how quickly. As far as cuts are concerned, um, in, it's estimated that there'll be $14 billion in decreases in Medicare payments. These have been slightly delayed. I don't maybe our speakers can talk about them later if they'd like to. And there's also uh, going to be some cuts for dis disproportionate share hospitals, uh, which the way they've set up the calculation should be the heaviest here because it's based on your uninsured rate, since ours is so low. All right, let me close with talking a little bit about, um, this is the division of insurance uh, is symbol here about one factor that has received a little bit of press, but if you're a business owner, um, it has made people very nervous, and it's rating factors. Bear with me here, I'll explain a little bit what this is. The cartoon here is uh, how some business owners have described to me the way they feel this is, the ground is moving on them and seesawing back and forth. So I wanna just dive into this for one second. So insurance uh, industry commissioned a report, looked at a bunch of different factors, uh, moving in the ACA and its impact on Massachusetts, but the real headline was buried in a footnote. And Wakely is the company, it's run by the former executive director of the Connector, oddly enough. And so Wakely estimates that the potential range of impacts on premiums due to this one change, regulatory change, will be either negative 66% in how much you're gonna pay in premiums, or plus 97% plus trend. <laughs> so a lot of winners and losers happening in the state due to this one change. And as a result, technically, almost all the plans in Massachusetts will be canceled, using the definition that's been used nationally. Now, for most people, they won't feel the difference. We have some folks here from the plan, from the insurance plans, and I'm sure they can explain to you in great detail how they're transitioning people. But technically, most of the plans are non-compliant and will have to be canceled or 
changed drastically. Uh, this just hasn't been reported in the press up until this date. Massachusetts had, what, is, what are the rating factors? Massachusetts had somewhere between nine to 11 factors that determined how much you paid for your premium. And they were things like that are listed here. What industry you worked in, how many people at your company participated. These were all used to underwrite your policy. What's listed here on the screen is what will be eliminated due to the Affordable Care Act. And as a result, there will only be four rating factors, your family composition, the ages that are covered, where you live or your business is located. And there is a fourth, which is tobacco usage. However, the states prohibited that. So there really will only be three. So as a result, there is going to be a big impact they'll show you here of uh, premiums going up and down. So the state issued this report and looked at that they had 85,000 individuals who are purchasing insurance on their own and about 634,000 buying or who get it from companies uh, smaller than 50. So here's what the impact is. 60% of people who get their insurance will see an increase due to this one regulatory change. Now this has nothing to do with the taxes that we just talked about. This is just this one regulatory change. And of course that means and leaves the rest of that group to see some sort of decrease. Now there'll be about, the real losers here are about 46,000 people who see premium increases over 30%. I highlight this to say there's just a lot of disruption happening in the marketplace. We anticipate that a lot of these individuals will switch plans, try to increase deductibles or co-pays to try to keep premiums down, but this just gives you an illustration of what's taking place and if you, if you have your insurance broker, call them up. I'm sure they can go into great detail about how they're having to run multiple scenarios for their clients this year to try to figure out where they're going to land for their insurance policies. And I want to just talk a little bit about this process because it gives again how screwy this implementation has been. And for those of you that are familiar with uh, Schoolhouse Rocks and how legislation is made, this is actually a very different process. It's how a regulation became a bill, which is not usually how this works. So the state ran this study that I just referenced um, in 2012 and they wrote to the federal government, and this is their language, warning of extreme premium increases. They were very concerned. They floated this idea of a waiver saying Massachusetts already has coverage, we need to be able to have some sort of waiver here so that small businesses aren't negatively impacted. Well, the feds denied that quietly, but did come up with this three-year phase down that the insurers can't use certain factors each year. Doesn't fix the problem, just kicks the can down the road. So the Division of Insurance explained how this was going to work, and then politics got involved, where the state Senate said, no, we are getting either so much heat from our constituents, or we don't like the direction this is headed. The state has traditionally regulated our uh, insurance market. The federal government is now taking that role. So they passed an amendment forcing the governor to formally request a waiver. It was denied, as you can imagine. However, as Secretary Sebelius has left, recently or is leaving soon, she granted a one-year delay of this. Again, doesn't fix the problem, just delays it. I highlight this, highlight this just to say that there is a lot of confusion locally about the impact on our premiums and the goalposts keep moving. And for those of you that either work at the insurance companies, the, inf uh, the connector turmoil and uncertainty is leading to a lot of concern about increased premiums in the future or fewer choices. So this has not played out fully and it's gonna be very interesting to see how it does. I will, these are just some of my things that I'm watching over the next couple of years and I'm gonna introduce our speakers because they'll touch on, I, I assume, a handful of these more nationally, um, but this is some of the issues, whether it's related to the connector or on the delivery side that, that's going to be taking place over the next 24 months.